We are in still the Gospel of Matthew, but we're coming, coming rapid, coming fast toward the end. We're in Matthew 19. I want to pick up very briefly and review a little bit about what we talked about last time, and that was about Jesus' constant marriage and divorce. Because we were about out of time, I didn't say something that was very important, which I'm going to say tonight, and then we're going to move ahead and go through about two chapters probably tonight. Any questions or comments about Matthew 19 that we've covered so far? Any, any questions? Remember the ancient world. I want to repeat this a little bit. I think it's worth it because I think probably you didn't hear the stuff I'd ever said before. In Jesus' time period, 99% of the time, outside of extreme cases, only Jewish men could divorce Jewish women. Outside of extreme cases. Jewish. So when Jesus talks about divorce, he's speaking primarily to Jewish men. Technically speaking. And in Greek, Greeks and Romans were a little different, but similar, but they had more rights to divorce than Jewish women did. The second thing is, in Deuteronomy 24, Deuteronomy 24, that's the passage that says you can't get divorced unless, or Moses said that, unless for any cause of indecency, for any reason of in, in, um, indecency. That was a long time ago in Deuteronomy. But in Jesus' day, several hundred years after that was written, in Jesus' day, two major schools of Jewish thought reigned supreme, two big teachers, Hillel and Shammai. And they interpreted that verse differently. The Hillites, those who followed Hillel, had a looser version. So when it says any cause of indecency, they said any cause and indecency are two separate things. And so we have now a technical sense of the any cause divorce. So, in Matthew 19, when it says in verse 3, And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife? Some translations have different things, but in Greek it's okay to say, For any cause. Is it okay to divorce his wife for any reason? For any cause. And so the any cause, in his, stay with me, in his time period, the any cause divorce is when a Jewish man can divorce his wife or... Any cause, for any reason they want to. And they did make up all kinds of reasons to say, I found a prettier woman, you burnt my toast, you were gone for more than three weeks. Any old reason. And all you had to do was say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Give her a little certificate that says you're free to remarry. And that's over. That's over. They don't say, well, let me get my belongings. You know. Now, there's some legal ramifications financially and so forth. That's true. But the Shemaites, Shemaites and his students, said, no, 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 it's the, indecent, the indecency. So when Jesus is talking about divorce, he's talking about, he's joined, they're trying to get him right in the middle of a common debate of the, of the day. And that was, is the any cause divorce legal or not legal? Is the any cause divorce legal or not legal? Matthew 19, 3. So to be real specific, I heard David got divorced. He divorced Elaine. Why do you do it? Uh, he found someone who was hotter. That means more pretty and old people. We know what hot is. You know the hot is, good. It's hard to imagine, but he found someone who had natural blonde hair, and he wanted that. Okay, well, why did he do that? And there's an argument arises here in this room. You can't do that. Deuteronomy 24 says, no, no, you can't. You have to have an indecency. Another side of the argument joins up. Cassie says, no, 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 no. He says, for any cause of indecency. David has the right to divorce her at any cause he wants to. And then we start debating back and forth. Now imagine that's the ancient world and Jesus walked in. Jesus, whose side are you on? Jesus says, if you divorce a wife for the any cause divorce, for any reason, if that's why you divorce her, that's not good. Because in God's eyes, so to say, hyperbolically, you're still married. So if she goes and remarries someone else, Though she's following the law because that guy gave her a divorce certificate, it's like she's an adulteress. It's hyperbole. He knows that woman who's been abandoned is not an adulterous woman. He knows that. The point is just saying it's a big, big deal. It's a big deal. You can't just quickly cut off what God put together. I'm, and this is real fast from last time, but I think it's worth repeating. And also, another thing I want to say is this. What this is not doing is giving us the answer to the question, David, is there any reason a Christian or a Jew would ever get divorced? No, it's not. It's just one example. 
So Jesus says, you can't get divorced. He doesn't want you to do that. Well, they say, well, then why did Moses command it? That's in verse 7. He says, in verse 8, because you were hard of heart. That's not the way God wanted it. It's a concession. Many, 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 many laws in the Old Testament are just concessions. It's not what God wants. It's a concession. That's it. So God moves around people, moves them along morally at the pace they can handle it. Kind of like us, I think. The other place he talks about divorce in the Old Testament, like I said last week, was, is uh, Exodus 21, uh, 10 to 11. And that passage is when it talks about marrying another woman, which is very common, particularly if your brother, so I, my brother Stephen, imagine he dies, his wife Angel and his two boys, Brent Braxton, everybody, and almost everybody in the Mediterranean world, they would know it's my obligation to marry Angel, his, his widower, his widow, right? And take on the boys. She'd come to my home. She doesn't have a 401k. She can't own land. Jewish women are at the mercy of their husband. And so it'd been the moral right thing to do to take care of her. And so she'd become my legal wife. So it was common for Jews to have more than one wife. Not everyone did it. Did you marry people just for fun? If you were loaded and had a lot of money? That happened, but not as often as far as we have historical reference. Like kings or very, very wealthy people would do it kind of to have more wives, to have more babies. If you didn't have a baby, they blamed the woman. There was something wrong with her oven. They had no, because they thought the woman was an incubator and uh, it, she was broken. They had no concept that the man and sperm, they had none of, no concept of that. Um, that it carried the birth, that the life was carried that way. And so if a woman couldn't have bigger children, you got to marry someone else too, because someone's got to carry on the line. Okay, in that context, Exodus 21, 10 to 11, he says, when you marry the second woman, and you say, well, I love Susan more than the first one now. He says, basically, you can't neglect the first one it's because you love the second one more. Well, everybody would know that means by default, you're supposed to not neglect either wife. The point is, to be married, you can't neglect it. And he says, if you do neglect the first one, she has a right to leave you. She has a right to divorce you. So in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, there are different reasons why it's okay to get divorced. But first, I want to say it again like Jesus did. That's not what God wants. But there are grounds for it. One is neglect, food, shelter, and you might say uh, uh, physical, emotional care. Exodus 21, 10 to 11, we might say neglect. And by the way, in counseling, most divorces I've ever dealt with in counseling is neglect. And it's almost always the person who's being neglected who comes to me and feels so guilty about the divorce. And they go, now what do I do? I say, what's going on? And almost always the story is, he left you a long time ago. How long has he been with that other woman? They live together? Well, the Bible says I can't get divorced because that's, I can't be forget. What? You just, this paperwork after this, he left you a long time ago. Um, that usually is the case, unfortunately. The other option, of course, is to say that uh, there's any matter of indecency. Okay, that's a big review. Now I'm going to start adding what I didn't say last week. This has been a review so far in the first five or six minutes. Any questions or comments about what I've said so far? If you want more details, go back and listen. The pod, it's on my podcast the last time we met at the podcast, so I spent 30, 40 minutes on that. So I know that's a quick and furious thing. Okay, let me say something before I get the new stuff. Remember in verse 10 and following, the disciples say, if that's the case, a man and his wife, it's not expedient to marry. That is, the disciples don't want to be stuck with a lemon. <laughs> they don't want to be stuck with a wife. They can't get out of the marriage contract. If marriage is that sacred... Why even get married? If I can't look for a way out, why even get married in the first place? And that's what they're saying. And Jesus says, not if I can receive that, verse 11. In the ancient world, Jews, Greeks, Romans, and Christians, later on, had different reasons not to get married. Some people said you shouldn't get married for sacred reasons. Some did it for I mean, all kinds of reasons. But in general, Jesus doesn't say that. He doesn't praise people who stay celibate. He doesn't praise people who get married. He just doesn't. He says some people are eunuchs. That means celibate. Some by birth. Some by choice. Some for the kingdom of heaven. Whatevs. He says in the verse 12 at the very end, he says, who is able to receive this, let him receive it. So there's not an extra special sacredness being married. I hear this all the time in church life. I probably said this last time. But that's your first ministry. And God really intended that. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. I preached on this not long ago. Jesus said, if you don't hate your mother and father, as it were, compared to me. So he doesn't put family above allegiance to him. He's like, depends up to you. 
If you're going to treat marriage that sacred, go for it. Get married. If not, do it for the kingdom of heaven and stay single. Well, this leads to my new part. What is so important to understand that we might take for granted or dismiss because today's culture, I had a feeling it was going to dry. I got this wipes later on. What is very important to understand is every Jew who ever lived and all the way up to about the 1960s and 70s and every Christian that ever lived until about the 1960s or 70s knew that marriage happened as Jesus said, and that is in verse 4. Have you not read from the him made from the beginning, made them male and female? And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. They're no longer two, but one. What God has joined together, let no one, put, uh, no, let no one separate. That is absolutely, and I cannot say this emphatically enough, that is the standard universal view of Jews. Every document that has been discovered in Judaism supports that. From rabbis, Josephus, Philo, maybe people never heard of, Old Testament, um, forever. So that means anything besides man and woman and, and a, anything sexual that is not between a man and woman married is an egregious sin. They didn't date. They weren't friends with benefits. Um, almost certainly, males and females didn't even kiss. They didn't hold hands. They got married, and then things were physical. In general, it seems to have been the case that male and female probably treated each other as brother and sister until they were married. And it was a huge scandal if they did anything outside of that. So there's no concept in Judaism, and not in Christianity, of cohabitation, living together before marriage, um, doing anything physical or sexual at all outside of marriage, and certainly if you're married with someone else. And because they had a word for that. Now, of course, it was in Greek, porkeia, uh, but it means adultery. And so over and over in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus, over and over and over, it's talked about how that sin, sin, sin. Jews never did that. And that's one of the ways Jews were different from Greeks and Romans in the time period of Jesus, is Greeks and Romans did not agree with that. Romans and Greeks routinely practice that. Not dating so much, but sex from this 13, 14 all the way up. They had multiple partners. Bigamy, polyamory that is multiple love, multiple partners all the time. Certain philosophers spoke against it. They frowned upon it, but everyone did it. It was absolutely standard to have sexual relationships with your slaves. In fact, in a lot of Roman households, women slept on one side with their female slaves and men with their boy slaves. They slept apart. They don't sleep in the same bed, same side of the house. And they did stuff with their slaves. It was well known that Greeks, and particularly Roman soldiers, went off to war, did things with other male soldiers. Um, they also knew very much what it was like to have what we would call a monogamous love relationship. That was considered the highest form of relationship, male-to-male -male relationship, all the way back to, uh, well, Aristotle, but anyway, if you don't nerd talk, but so the highest form of love was between two males. It was considered the highest form. So the most common myth and legend today in the secular world is you Christians, bigots, while you talk about, you know, what's wrong with people loving each other? And they, back then, when Paul and Jesus talked about uh, against homosexual or home of this, whatever, they were only talking about when you exploit someone or men raping boys and whatever. Anybody who says that does not know the ancient evidence. They simply do not. It was, a, in the ancient world, a great analogy, though it was a Greco-Roman society. Based on the documents we have and the paintings we have, it was just like today. So where we're fighting, we as a culture, fighting for gender fluidity and uh, love all, and I, I love all ways and any ways, any kind of sexual relationship, that's Greek and Roman society with a bow on it. They didn't have the same uh, mor mores. The reason why this whole concept of they had to fight for it in this society is because it's been influenced so much by Judaism and Christianity that said you don't do that. Male and female marriage alone. Someone here at this church, early when I got here, said, but David, but David, society has evolved past that. But that's that basic kind of pagan assumption that we've moved past it. And Christianity, the assumption was all the society now is is dark in mind and soul pagan. That is, Christianity was the enlightened view. But now, common American and Western society has flipped it.
to where the standard Judeo-Christian view that man, marriage is a man and a woman is now backwoods, dark, and whatever. So you have to evolve past it. So this idea that what is considered sexual appropriate and inappropriate is certainly in different cultures, but Jews were different. They never, ever said it was okay. And Christians never, ever said okay. I can say a lot more about that. So what would count as indecency, except for indecency? At minimum, it would be adultery. What's interesting is the word they use for indecency is porneo. Porneo, the, the Greek word porn, porni, if you, it looks like this. Pete, I don't know if y'all can see what it is. Porni, with a long e. Porni means prostitute. And porneia, if you add basic, it's not an I, but in Greek it's eo to alpha. Porneia means um, things that are like a prostitute would do, which of course means sleep around. So at minimum, porneia means to have sex with other people while you're married. But in, it's interesting he used this word because if he wanted to say adultery, there's a different Greek word for that, poikeia. That's a different word. That's a specific term. This is now, by this time, a generic term for any kind of sexual indecency. That, you ask the question, based on what? Great question. Based on how Jews understood the concept. And Jews understood the concept based on the Old Testament. The Old Testament, every single time it talks about sexuality, is man and woman. A man can be married to different wives. I've already said that. That's not the same as man bearing man, woman, woman, never, ever, ever. And so what would be involved in this porneia? Anything else. So one of the worst egregious possible sins, in fact, to this day, it's considered one of the non-negotiables. They will be killed before they ever do this, and that's incest. And porneia is, you get a, so adultery is that, incest is porneia, um, any kind of relationship. And by the way, if you think, well, we would never do that, they did in the ancient world. In Egypt, in the exact same time period, brothers and sisters married. In Egypt. Yeah, that's just crazy. They would never do that today. Why not? They made arguments back then that was okay. Now, Greeks and Romans frowned upon it, but most cultures in the Mediterranean world married at least their first cousins. Some had rules against that. So incest was not that uncommon in the ancient world, certainly just for sex, but even for marriage. Brother and sister could get married in Egypt. Uh, but Jews said no. You can have adultery. Everyone else said, yeah, you can. Well, it's not the right thing to do, but yeah, you can. Um, you couldn't have multiple partners. Can't do that either. You can't do anything sexual before marriage or outside before marriage. Other cultures said, yeah, you can. That was very common. Uh, you certainly, over and over Leviticus, I mean, it's, it's the death penalty if you do anything with the same gender, same sex, male, male, female, female. Uh, Greeks and Romans said, yeah, you can. So did Egyptians. Yeah, you can. So you think of anything else that was uh, raping, of course, fortunately, that's also all through Deuteronomy. You get stoned for that if you rape. There's just one text that says, if the woman is raped, but she does not cry for help, they're both stoned. And atheists love to say, oh, you know, stone the rape woman victim. No, no, no. The point is, if she didn't cry for help, she wanted it. In other words, there was no, she wanted to be, so it was outside sex, then before marriage or outside marriage. So the point is, you can think of any other, oh, another one I missed out is animals. Bestiality in, ex, in, uh, in Old Testament, it specifically prohibits that. We know those kinds of things did happen in the ancient world. Um, they still happen now in the world. In China and Asia, I've looked up documented cases of people in different countries in the world today who were forced to marry the goat or the dog or whatever because of what they had done with the animal. In their culture, they said, now you've got to marry it. So for us, it might say, it's just cuckoo. Why? That's, it's all love, man. All I'm saying is we all make up our minds depending on what we think, and this is the key here. Hello? We all make up our minds. Uh, uh, that's Tiffany, everybody. We all, we're in Matthew 19. We all make up our minds. On, listen here, because this is the key that makes people so very angry. But just ethically speaking, we all make up our minds on what we consider authoritative. So I'm going to ask this rhetorically, and then I'm going to move on. I think I'm going to move on. Because I did want to say, I meant to, this is very important to understand. Sister and brother, what about you? What about you? I left out pedophilia. That was very common in the ancient world. Jews said, nope. Um, you didn't have anything sexual with children, ever. They had to be deemed an adult by their parents. So the point is, anything, anything. And those people who support any of these other relationships, polyamory, multiple sisters, brothers, wives, sister wives, like Mormons do or can do, 
um, homosexual behavior, or those that they'll say, well, Jesus didn't know, or Jesus never talks about homosexual marriage. The answer is, no, he doesn't. Nor does he talk about incest. Nor does he talk about raping people. There's a lot of things he doesn't talk. They also say we shouldn't go beat up homosexuals. Therefore, we should, right? Well, no. But he says here specifically that marriage from the very beginning was between man and woman. And so we have to wrestle the fact that that's what Jesus said. Even if you don't like Paul, fine. Jesus said this. I mean, everyone knows that Paul, Jesus said it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, good, good point. So Mary and Joseph, it says in the text, Matthew, and he knew her not. And Matthew's text, the angel, he goes a dream. Angel tells him, don't divorce her. He says, basically, okay, and he, didn't have, he knew her not. He didn't have sex with her until Jesus was born. That's right. And if I'm a Jew, very good point. If I'm a Jew in the first century and I read that, I go, good for him. In other words, they didn't go, really? How did he make it? Brother, you are strong. Give me a high five. How would you make it that far? <laughs> you, didn't even, what, you didn't do anything with her? I mean, anything with her? Well, you do kind of wonder that. That's right. But for them, they would not ever. That is hugely scandalous. You could get divorced immediately. That's what Joseph, remember, <laughs> I love how C.S. Lewis says it. Joseph doesn't want to divorce Mary because he doesn't know where babies come from. He knows where babies come from. He's not an idiot. That's why he wants to divorce her. And adultery in some other places was immediate grounds for divorce. In fact, later on, Jewish text said, if that happened, you were morally culpable. You were sinning if you did not divorce because the assumption was as soon as she, and it's always the she, she had sex with another man, she's now bound with him. So if you do not divorce, you are, it's implicitly, in their view, approving of it. Um, Jesus doesn't say that. I'm saying in Judaism, it's so important to keep it righteous. There were big consequences not to wait till marriage day. That's right. That so, could have thrown Joseph into being called now an adulterer. Because that's exactly right. Joseph could have been a called adulterer. Yes, ma'am. He result, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it, it, was, it was a risky thing he did. Absolutely. Because as soon as you start showing, hey, you didn't get, when did you get married? Joe? I mean, this isn't Houston or a big town or say even here. It's a village. They know Joseph's getting married to Mary, and they know, like, we could say Mary, but I mean. So how come she wasn't stoned then? How come she wasn't stoned? Good question. Well, a few things. One is, in Luke's gospel, we learn that she leaves town. She oh, goes, yeah, hangs yeah. out with her Elizabeth, you know, the cousin, and then comes back. Right. She got out of Dodge. She got out of Dodge. The second thing is, what's interesting is, I don't know of any evidence in Jewish literature that those capital punishment punishments are actually enacted. So, I deal a lot with atheists and skeptics, and they go, look at the Old Testament, stoning rebellious children, or stoning adulterers, whatever, and they're killing people left and right. Well, we don't have evidence they actually did it. We don't. It's the law. It's the, it seems to have been the case, maybe at most, or at least at minimum, it's there to make a massive wall, a law that says, it's that serious, don't do it. Right. To scare the bejesus out of them, whatever. Um, we just don't have evidence they actually did it. And certainly not in the first century. We don't have a, uh, hey Jack, we don't have it. There's a chair there over here too, if you want. Um, see, we don't have evidence they got stoned anywhere in the first century. That's a good question. Um, it's, it's interesting. A little footnote when it comes to capital punishment. If they did other, you know, to, to the death penalty, later rabbis made up tons of reasons. Not reasons. They gave ways to prohibit it. That is, they didn't want it to enact it. Well, did they mean it, or was it the first infringement? They kind of made reasons to delay it. They weren't just going around trying to kill everybody. Well, the difference was, and this is a lot of people, Christians, get confused when I read the New Testament, is that that's different from a mob. A mob is not an acting capital punishment, and they kind of sort of are, but they've lost control. Right. So in Acts 7, it's anarchy. it's anarchy. So when Stephen gets stoned in Acts 7, people go, see, they ain't acting capital No. He does a long, fat sermon while the temple's Irrelevant now. They grab some they rawr, boom, you know, they're just they're ticked off. No one's they got to go to court. Okay, we hear you, hear you, you've been given a death sentence. No, they go crazy. So that's not, in Act 7 is not an example of capital punishment. Later on I'm gonna do a study on homosexuality in particular and say all those things that you know I want to say, but now I'm just trying to do the study of Matthew. Um, I, and I'll say this and I'll move on. If you have any questions or comments, I want to I end on this. 
because when I ever say the word homosexual, it brings up all kinds of things. One is the Bible never uses the word. The word itself was invented about 100, 150 years ago. So, of course not. But for Jews, they would say uh, man for man, or Paul says man for man, woman for woman. So the point is that term is not there. It's exactly right. The term is not anywhere in the Old New Testament. The word homosexual is an invented term. The concept was there forever because Greeks and Romans and some Egyptians practiced it um, commonly. So one thing is I'm telling you, I'm conceding that. That's a very common charge. Is the Bible even uses the word in, in the Greek. You're right. That doesn't mean the concept's not there. Two, Old and New Testaments don't say anything about what we call orientation a person's predilections or interest. I am, by default, um, attracted to women. And that's an orientation. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. I'm not righteous or more like Jesus because I'm attracted to women. It's a biological state, as far as we can tell in the Bible and even Christian philosophers. The Bible doesn't say anything about orientation. It says anything about behavior. And this is where people get mad and say, why can't you act on your inclinations? Well, that's the whole Bible. I can get rageful and I'm not supposed to murder. I'm not supposed to hate. I'm not even supposed to call someone fool. That's what Jesus said. I have huge inclinations to do things to beautiful women. I can't do anything at all. I'm married. I have inclinations all the time. Well, I'm really hungry. I really want that shoe or that dress or that jewelry. You can't steal it. But I have inclination. Some people have a natural inclination. For, I mean, you see my point is on and on and on. And there's a word for that that is translated from the Greek very easily called self-control. You are controlling impulses. And some people have stronger impulses for certain things. And that's the case. So the Bible says nothing about orientation. So technically speaking, everybody says, is it a sin to be gay? The answer is no. No, it's not a sin to be gay. It's not righteous to be straight. Like, I'm not more like Jesus because I like women. You're not less like Jesus if, you, if I like the man. The issue is what do I do with my body? What I do with my body. And that's what they talk about. And the third thing I'm going to say, and that is, I'm always incredibly aware of the very, very sensitive nature of the topic. I'm very aware of it. I know people get killed. They, suicide is one of the highest rates among people uh, in uh, the gay community. Not to mention diseases and so forth. It's a very sensitive subject, and people have been made fun of. And, I mean, I know, I know, in, at this church, I've been a huge lightning rod for massive rage, and I still am the object of massive rage, just because to them I represent people who have hurt their relatives or made fun of their relatives or want their relatives to hurt. I hate gay jokes, making fun of them. I don't, I hate it. It's completely unchristian. So when I say these things, and I'm trying to give as honest to God opinion I can on good exegesis, how did I understand these texts in the ancient world, as I've done from the last 18 chapters? I didn't get to this part all of a sudden, because I hate the gays, I changed my mind. No, I, I'm trying to give good exegesis. But having said that, a lot of people think, David's, oh, David, your point is, therefore, go hurt gay people. Or go tell them they're subhuman. No. Some people do that. I'm not one of them, and that's not Christian. Jesus would never have done that either. Never, ever, ever would have treated people differently because of an orientation. He met people who were greedy, who took care advantage of the poor, who stole from people, and he had dinner with them, and he loved them. I mean, my neighbors, literally here, neighbors, is a lesbian couple with two kids, two girls. We had a long conversation yesterday. We got home, chat with them. We know the girls. Can't remember the names right now. The girls' name, the little baby girls. We talk to them all the time. I don't look. I'm, oh, I don't carry stones in my pocket just in case I see them. Here they come. You get the left one. I get the. I mean, that's just crazy. But for a lot of people, that's exactly what they conjure in their mind when you say anything like what I've said here tonight. So no matter what I say right now, some of the people who hate this or watch online hear it still. The rage fills them. Because my voice now represents to them all the pain they have experienced or their relative or their loved one has experienced. And I'm sorry that their loved one has experienced. And the church, and I'll, I'm preaching on purpose, the church should be in between the rocks and the homosexual. We should be in between the rocks, disallowing it at all costs. No one should be treated differently because of that.
And we should be loving them and caring at the same time. We have to be obedient to what Jesus taught. He did not ask my opinion. He said, he said it. And I, I didn't write the New Testament. And then is it a struggle? I'm sure it is. And there's a lot more to be said. I'm going to save that from the study. But I don't want to stop there. I just I feel always compelled to say all the things in the conclusion before I move on so that it doesn't sound like I'm being insensitive or something. Any questions or comments about anything? If not, I'll move on. Right, those are good. Those are good questions. So, where does do homosexuals do they make it up? Uh, as far as we can tell from the ancient literature, no. The ancient people did have the concept of orientation. It's a common legend and myth today that they didn't understand it back then. Now things are all different. If you hear that ever, it means they don't know the ancient evidence. Ancient literature does suggest they do. They absolutely understood the concept of a general orientation disposition. Greeks, Romans, and as far as I can tell, some Egyptians, certainly Greeks and Romans, didn't have a problem with it at all. Jews did not speak about an orientation. They spoke about behavior. So the term homosexual, that kind of stuff, I personally don't get bogged down with that because I don't care what the term is. They would, what, what I care about, what they talked about, what Jesus said was, his assumption is man and woman get married. And every Jewish and Christian text we have forever, except for like the 1960s and 70s, thanks all you 60s people, um, they all said the same thing. And that's something. It's something that's universally the same thing. That is marriage and sex is between a man and woman and marriage. Everything else is outside of what God wanted. So, so it doesn't like any sin. Right. So, so we, we don't, okay, based on my reading, based on my reading and learning in the last 10, 20 years, as far as my understanding is, we don't know what God's view is is of orientation. We do know what God's view is of the behavior. You see the difference? Kind of. I don't know what God thinks about orientation because the Bible doesn't tell me. The Bible does tell me a whole lot about the behavior itself. And that is what he calls a sin. And that's and it's a good point. And if I can jump on nuance a little bit, I, I, I mean, you've heard me say this several times in the study because it's worth repeating all the time in my ministry experience. A lot of people think when you declare something as sin, they think the next natural logical step is go tell everybody they're a sinner. So if you're on the street, Master, you're sinning, you're sinning. You're, I mean, my neighbors, oh, you're all going to hell. I, I don't know where they were going. Give me a break. But there, I mean, that's a common sentiment that People are scared to even use the word sin because they think the next thing they have to go do is go tell them that they're sinning. Those don't relate. As I said over and over, it's worth repeating, Christians are never called, ever, we're never commanded or implied to go tell non-Christians what their sins are. We're not called to do that. We want to get people to Jesus. Let Jesus do all the cleaning up he needs to do on all of us. Amen? Yeah. So that's what our call is to get to Jesus. The gospel message is the... Messiah, God has come, Messiah, death for our sins, resurrected from the dead. He didn't say, and tell them that they're sinners. I mean, that this particular sin needs to be cleaned up, and then they'll get saved. That's not the gospel. But, but nuance says, remember, inside of the Christian community of faith, we can. The Apostle Paul says explicitly in verse 3 and 6, we are supposed to judge those inside. That is, judge their behavior. If we've taken care of our log first. If we, in Matthew 7, if we take care of the log first, or not, that's exactly right. So even though... What's clear is we don't judge outside world. And even when we judge behavior on the inside world, we're told how to do it. We're doing it in certain ways. Paul says in first, remember in Galatians 6, he says, do it in a spirit of gentleness. So the next step isn't going, oh, I'm, you know, I'm the sin police. But rather, we are called to help each other out. So that means as a Christian, forget my job here as pastor, just as a Christian, it means it's my moral duty to get that daggum speck out of my own eye and it's my moral duty to help others do the same thing. So anybody in this room that I think is violating some so-called clear teaching of the text, I'm supposed to help you stop doing it. I'm morally obligated to help you stop doing it. It's all through the text, and I've said this in many studies, and it's exactly right. Matthew 18, uh, Galatians 6, 1 Corinthians 6. I go down the list of all these places. We're supposed to go help people. Uh, so that means if they come to the Christian church and they are a Christian, I can't call sins not sins. That's lying. And I'll do more damage. I'm a false teacher. And he says, if you call any of these little ones to sin, his students, it's better to what? Have a millstone stuck around that. In other words, you better kill yourself. That, you're better off that than calls another one to sin. So if I call a sin a good thing, 
I'm going to cause you to stumble or to be scandalized. That means to sin. So it's a big deal in churches when we not only say it's all right, we bless it. Now, maybe I'm dead wrong in all my research and all the people who think like the history of the church forever is wrong. Okay, but if we're not, then it's a big deal to teach the wrong thing. And there, I'll move on for that. So yes, behavior is the issue. Anything else? That's a good question. Why, you, why do you seem to be more sensitive if they're family members who are gay versus not family members? And I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. It's something worth exploring. Um, and you used the word earlier, homophobic. Homophobia, of course, technically speaking, is a serious psychological disorder where you have a sustained, irrational, exorbitant amount of fear toward a homosexual. Like having a phobia of clowns or spiders or roaches, people freak out or fear of heights. It's like I find out you're gay and I go, <gasps> or they have a panic attack or an anxiety attack, or they run out of the room. That is technically homophobia. But now what's used as absolute slander. So the fastest way to shut you up is call you homophobic. Just if you say anything besides, I love gays, you're homophobic. Well, technically, I mean, you just declared a serious disorder that needs psychological treatment. But on a loose, loose, loose definition, it means you don't like the gays. Well, we live with slams all the time. Jesus says, blessed are you if you persecute for my name's sake. That's just going to happen. But we also do have to wrestle the fact psychologically, some of us have, like you, and I appreciate your candor and openness, some of us have just different struggles. Some people will have a real sensitivity to that issue. Some don't have as much sensitivity. Like, oh, I'm cool with it. Not with behavior, but oh, it doesn't bother me. Some people go, I really have an emotional response. Some do that to people of different races, different genders, different whatever. And we just have to own it. We have to own it psychologically, own it. We say, God, this is the best I've got, so make me better. And help me love them no matter what. Well, David, how do I treat them? How do you want to be treated? Jesus said that in Matthew 7, 12. How do you want to be treated? Oh, oh, do, ah. Put your stones down. Put your stones down. Put your stones down. And um, leave that up to God. But if someone asks you, you tell them what Jesus taught. Then go back to Jesus. Uh, anyway, verse 13. If not, go ahead. Okay. Speaking of put your stones down toward me too. If you hate me, I'm just kidding. Then children, it's another example of what he just said basically earlier, right before this long chapter 19 spiel. He also said this thing about children. He says it kind of again. The children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. They lock it off. But Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and he went away. So once again, Matthew likes to double things up. He'll say it one way and they say it and he'll say it again. Or there's two blind men. And a second, there's going to be two this and two, there's two donkeys. And so there's, Matthew loves to double up. Unlike Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew does. So here's two different children's stories. Um, and it's the same point. Don't hinder them, belongs the kingdom of heaven. These children come to me. They can't provide any needs on their own. They need what we give them. And they have no status. There's no entitlement. So don't kick them out of here. These. And it's hard for us to imagine that because most people, not everyone, you meet people, uh, I hate kids, but most people have some kind of sensitivity towards children. Uh, and then a significant portion love kids. But in the ancient world, they might have loved kids, but kids were not seen like we see them today. They're not little adults. They don't really serve a lot of function and purpose. They can't have a job. They can't own anything. So socially speaking, they're just... It, the best evidence analogy I can think of is like it was for a lot of people in the 40s, 50s, and 60s in America, which is that children were supposed to what? Sit still, be quiet until what? Talk to or said something to you. You don't talk until someone says your turn. And if you're Thanksgiving dinner, you close your mouth or whatever. I mean, that's the, well, in the ancient world, as far as we can tell, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. So for a child to want to come up and he says, no, it's okay, it's okay, the disciples want to go, oh, shucks, I knew better. They would go like, what in the world? I mean, this is a great rabbi. We ain't got time for this nonsense. He's teaching. Don't get in his presence. So no, come here, come here, come here, come here. Grabs all the kids, puts them on the lap, pats on them, and says, be like they are. Be like they are. It's crazy how your point is that back in, back in the Egyptian days and back in the ancient days and how everything was so strict and everything just gets easier and opener. You know I mean? Look at it now. It's just crazy. And literally. I mean, it's from when my grandpa was a, a 
little kid from when I was a kid and now my kids, I mean, it's, it's insane. I mean, you really look at it like that. Times that have changed. It's. I knew I started getting old when I started saying back a few years ago, I remember when I was young, I, oh my goodness, oh. I'm old now. <laughs> oh. It's the music that my kids listen to. It's the music. Now it's kind of like when I was young, we had to say ma'am and sir. When I was young. It seems like as we get older, people are more nowadays wanting us to be seen and not heard. Right? This is true. Yeah, particularly in America. The older you get, the more you're, you're expendable. But Asian cultures, Mexican cultures, and African cultures, you're prized, you're an elder. But uh, in the West, yeah. Verse 16, so be like a child. Verse 16, and behold, one came to him saying, Teacher, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? To have, that key word, like he's possessing it. He's possessing it. Uh, and this is like the story in Mark's gospel, but a little in Mark 10, this is a little different though. And he says, why do you ask me about what is good? One there is who is good. There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Which is interesting. And if it were to stop there, that would have been really, really interesting to me in the gospel. But of course he doesn't. It ends up being a, a parable, a bigger story of what happens. In verse 18, he said to him, which ones? <laughs> as far as we can tell, Jews did ask that question often. Which ones do I got to really keep? I used to have students I sell all the time like, they, what do I do got to get C? I always had those students. What do I do to pass? And we have evidence that Jews would come up to certain rabbis and go, tell me the biggies. And they would limit it down to one, two, or three. So here you're saying, which ones? High five. So he respects Jesus as a teacher. Jesus says, you shall kill. It literally is murder. It's murder. Translations still keep saying kill, and that's not good. You shall not commit adultery. Commit not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Now, all those are the bottom five of the big ten, ten commandments. So that's how you treat each other. The first five of the ten commandments, how you treat God. Don't blaspheme his name and so forth. The bottom five are how you treat people. Notice he doesn't say keep Sabbath or Shabbat. That wasn't, anyway. But then he adds, Jesus adds one not from the ten commandments. And you should saw this coming from Leviticus, Leviticus 19.18. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's not in the Ten Commandments. The young man said to him, all these have observed. What do I got to do now? Woo! I'm almost at Disney. Jesus says, if you'd be perfect, that is, if you really be complete and whole, like you've commanded, done all the commandments, it's that last one, loving your neighbor as yourself. And so it gives an example of how this guy can love his neighbor as himself, and that is by what? Selling what he possesses and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. In Mark's text, this guy is called rich. In Matthew's text, he's called young. In Luke's text, another guy is called a ruler. And so a lot of times in church, they call him the rich young ruler. Unless these are different people, if it's the same person, that's fair. But at no time is he called the rich young ruler. Uh, they're called different descriptions. So you can be complete and whole. Just do one last thing. Go sell everything you have to the poor and follow me. When the young man heard this, Verse 22, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Two things are going on here that are really important. Two things, two assumptions. Two assumptions. One is, one is, most Jews in the ancient world, because of certain texts in the Old Testament, believed that wealth was a sign of God's blessing. Wealth was a sign of God's blessing. Little footnote, modern day prosperity preachers. God wants you to be rich and fulfilled and millions of dollars, da 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 da. They'll quote certain texts from Deuteronomy. That's one of their favorite places to go. And in the first century, it's, it seems to be pretty widespread belief that one of the major views, not the only, one of the major views that if a Jew was wealthy, it's because they were doing something right. That is to say, this blessing was a reward. Yahweh was going, high five, way to go. You're being righteous. I'm going to give you more cattle, more beautiful wives, or whatever it is, and more, more sons, more stuff. And so that's part of the assumption here is that he has, now that matters in a second. I'm gonna, and the story continues. The other major thing to understand is that most people in the Mediterranean world, from Greeks, Romans, and Jews, believe that <laughs> another way to understand well, this is going to sound contradictory, but so be it. Is that if you're wealthy, 
You are dishonest. You are unjust. You're dishonest. You are perhaps your modern day people. Uh, they call them shady. Uh, they ain't, something ain't right with you. Now, why is that? It's predicated on an assumption that many people in the world still have, but certainly in the Mediterranean world, and that's this. Supplies were limited. There's a limited pie of resources of food, water, shelter, and stuff, and land, and crops, and money. It's limited. So if you've got this pie, and I've got this little slice of pie, and then you get a bigger pie of stretches, that means you took someone else's. Most people in this time period in Palestine did the best job they could just to hold on to the land they inherited. It might be a plot of land as big as this room with some gardens, maybe a garden few here and there, the basket weave, that's all they got. Maybe a little bit more. And they're trying their best, and usually they didn't own it. And if they did own it, it was small. If they didn't own it, they had to pay a landlord a percentage of what they grew, and that got worse almost all the time. So they're, they're trying to survive and have children and feed them hand to mouth, water, uh, go fishing, do the best job you can. There, there's no sense of, zero sense of the American dream. No one had the concept that when I grow up one day, I'm going to be the emperor. You know what, dummy? You had to be born into that. You're born in that social status. Which means if <coughs> Tammy got real wealthy overnight or a few years, she was doing something wrong. Because there ain't no way she got that other big fat thing of land based on the land I saw that she had. There ain't no way she now has five cattle, and I know she only had one cattle. She's doing something ain't right. She's selling something on the side. She's stealing something. That is something ain't right. Uh, imagine for a second that, uh, you know, the IRS notices it, I've been told. I don't have, this never happened to me yet, but I've been told that if all of a sudden, all of a sudden you have some nice vehicles, a nice big house, they're like, huh, I thought you were a pastor, or I thought you were a school teacher. How can you afford this Corvette? How can you afford this nicer? How, what happened? I've been told you can get special audits and special visits by special people. Because it's something, what's well, the assumption? The assumption is you must have done something wrong. Something illegal, because based on your salary, it would never have happened. That was a general, it seems to have been, a general mindset of the ancient Mediterranean person across the board in general. So if you're wealthy, then what happens to all kinds of literature? There's a common assumption that wealthy people are dishonest. And they're not to be trusted. They are shady. They're unjust. They take advantage of the poor. And you see that throughout the New Testament as well. So probably based on those assumptions, I, I'm, not, I'm sparing the time, I could give you a lot of ancient resources, but I'm just, if you just trust me, I guess. So when this guy comes up and Jesus says in verse 21, go sell and give it to the poor, the assumption is probably two things. One is, if you really loved your neighbor as yourself, you would have been taking care of your poor neighbor. But you're not been taking care of your poor neighbor because you're rich. The second assumption is, if you had all that money, people got poor off of you somehow. So give the money back. It's this first thing that he addresses mixed with go love your neighbor as yourself. This next one, I'm going to come here in just a second, but you had your hand raised. I was just going to say, yeah, a lot of people would say money corrupts, or it can. Money corrupts. Well, I'm going to preach, yeah, in November. And, and Paul says to Timothy, he says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, that, is it literally the root of all poverty? No, it's a hyperbole. That is, man, loving that money, being wealthy, is going to make you do some things you shouldn't. that's your most important thing, then it's a problem. It is a big problem. It's the most, yeah, I think Jesus. This verse seems like why a lot of old people just want to get, get rid of all of their retirement really quick. Hmm. Like donate it. You know, sometimes they don't even take all their whole life and they're dying to like, give it all away. Go away. This next verse about the read. Next read. Well, if any retired person wants to give everything they have, my name is David yeah. Pendergrass. I have pens and markers and a college loan. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it will be hard for a rich man. But women are cool. Yeah. Just men. That's just a joke. <laughs> to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now listen, and as all jokes aside, I say this in sermons often because I mean it. I am rich. I live in America. I'm in the top 5% of the world's population, I think. If you make over fifty thousand dollars a year, you're in the. T I think it's top five percent of the world. Right? Of the world, yeah. hundreds of millions yeah. of people in China 
in Mexico living under five dollars a day. When I was making seven fifty an hour in this heat, you know, eighteen years ago roofing, just miserable. I, I heard that. I'm like, that isn't that bad. Living like a king. Yeah, I'm living good. I said this Sunday. I went. I went on vacation. I was in an airplane. I am rich. Just to make it, I mean, I try to get the cheapest ticket. I got the cheapest, right? but I mean, my point is, my point is, in verse 23, it is so easy to write this off to everybody else because everyone else has more money. Someone's got more money. Now, that is true. That is culture to, to some degree determines that. It's true. I'm not at all wealthy in American standard. I'm slap dab, middle class, whatever. But my point is, I don't want, personally, personally, I don't want to quickly jump around this real quickly by saying, well, a lot of people are richer than I am. That's true. I just want to take it very seriously about what he says first. And yes, ma'am. Move on with this. Yeah, it's about that. It's not a lot of people. So. Amen. I think Jesus, he doesn't say it this way. I think he would agree with this. And if I'm wrong, just ignore me and get there. And the heavenly realm say David was wrong. And I'm fine with that. I think Jesus would say, when I mean rich, what I mean is someone who has way more than they need. And that's why that's relative. So I don't think for a second you'd be in the category of rich based on those things. I mean, because I've been through, well, y'all heard my story. I mean, I've been on food stamps and poor and almost homeless and all that. So in those seasons, I wasn't rich at all. I wonder sometimes now, it's a middle class count. But I tend to think, yeah, it does. But I hear what you're saying. So there's a sense of metaphorically being rich and physical. It did make me stronger. It made me not care about stuff as much. That's for sure. Or my family. I don't care. I'm just kidding. It's just a joke. <laughs> I just see Jack's face. I, go, I, don't, I didn't learn that at all. I, um, I love my family. Yes, stuff, stuff can come and go. That's for sure. Um, so it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man or woman to enter the kingdom of God. In the medieval era, ages, one commentator, you know, 1,500 years after this, said, oh, the eye of a needle is a, Brit, is a certain entrance into Jerusalem and one of the walls. And so that's all he means. It's kind of hard. That's nonsense. There was no such thing called that. He means a needle. It was the smallest thing they could think of that had a hole in it. And the camel was the largest animal in Palestine. In fact, when Babylonian rabbis in Babylon used the exact same kind of analogy, they, the biggest animal was an elephant. They said it's easy for an elephant to go through the eye of a needle. So for him, it's a deliberate, huge hyperbole. It's easier for the largest beast I can think of to go through the tiniest hole I can think of than it is for the rich person. Good heavens! Now, it's a me I think, and not only is it a metaphor, because no one tries to put camels through eyes of needles, I think it's also hyperbole. That is... Is an exaggeration on purpose, but the point is still the same. That is, it is extremely difficult, listen, friends, for those who are wealthy to make it. Why? When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. And then who in the world can be saved? That's to my first point up here. If the rich people aren't making it in, and I thought they were rich because God was rewarding them for doing the right thing, who in the world can make it in? I'll say that one more time. If the rich are rich because God's blessing them, because they're doing the right thing, who in the world can be saved then? You need to understand that background so Jesus' answer makes sense. Verse 26. He looked at them and said to them, well, with men this is impossible. But with God all things are possible. The point is, you can't earn your way. You can't buy your way. You can't do the right thing. And that's the blessing and the salvation to come. He said, that's not the point at all. It's impossible for us to do the right thing enough to get blessed and rewarded enough for that to be enough. But God makes it possible. God doesn't need your currency. It's an act of grace. He's going to go back there in a second. This is, he set, Matthew sets us up for a parable. A very, very awesome, I think, an awesome and awesome parable. Verse 27, I'm not there yet. Verse 27, Then Peter said, Look around, Jesus. I'm paraphrasing. Lo, look, we left everything and followed you. What are we going to have? Look at us, man. Do, does it matter? That you, are you watching what we've done for you? And Jesus says, I say to you, in the new world. Now, let me, well, it doesn't matter. In the Greek, it means something like in the regeneration. He means certainly the world to come. When the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you will have followed me. You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Now that's a very Jewish thing to say. His point is, you'll be vindicated. It will matter that you followed me. Why is he sitting on the 12 tribes of Israel? Jews said, throughout several passages of the Old Testament, that Jews would sit on thrones. That is, God would mediate his judgment of the nations, the Gentiles, through the Jews. That's a way of saying they'll be vindicated. So when the Jews say, God, help us out. We've been exiled. The Gentiles are kicking our rear end all over the place. No, 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 no. In the world to come, I'm going to let you judge the Gentiles. And they go, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. I'll be up there on the winning side. Jesus is now saying you, his first 12 disciples, y'all, those who have followed me, you now take the role of what everybody knows is the Israel's role. Now you get it. Now you're not just judging Gentiles, you're judging what? Everyone. Now here in verse 28 it says the tribes of Israel. And that's what, now later on, um, I skipped ahead of myself, I'm sorry. Later on in Paul's literature and other places, the judgment takes on both people. But what's so radical here is he flips it, is that they, they, uh, they judge over the 12 tribes of Israel. So he thinks he is superseding it. Then everyone, verse 29, so verse 28 is, you'll be vindicated. I notice what you've got given up for me. I notice what you've gone through. Verse 29, and everyone who has left houses, or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and inherit life of the new age. Mark's gospel adds a hundredfold in the world to come and in this lifetime with persecutions. Now, almost every New Testament, well, every New Testament scholar I've read reads this meaning that in the early church, that is, any of the disciples who left behind the old way of life to become Jesus' disciples inherits all the houses and siblings they can possibly count in the new community that Jesus has created. Uh, John Townsend and Henry Cloud talk about the, the Christian philo- uh, counselors. They say it like, they say it like this. And I, it's clever and it's stuck in my head all these years. He said, it's supposed to be like this. We're supposed to move from our family of origin, our foo, to our fog, our family of God. Our food of fog. We're supposed to. I completely concur with them. And I think it's exactly what's going on in verse 29. Everybody who's left and gone through persecution and family members have cut them off. They have, quote, hated their brother and sister. That's Luke's vocabulary. But everyone who's given everything up for me, there is payback in the world to come. Yep, there's payback. There is payback. But even now, you get a hundredfold in the life of the community. And can I say very quickly, as a, as a pastor, I have seen this to be the case in my own life. Uh, my mom hasn't talked to me. I talked to her, I guess it's almost 10 years now. And several people in my life of the last 10 years have come in and been surrogate mothers to me through the church. And some of them I pointed out, like this mother over there taming her faces, and others in <laughs> different times. I could, people at this church, uh, different churches before, different times, have taken on, and I let that, be more of a mother role. Like my kids, when they first been here, it was real special to us, by the way, that certain el- uh, senior citizens came up and said, well, I can be your grandmother. I'm going to be because they don't see a grandma grandma that much or nana pappy. To our kids, that's very sweet to us. That meant a lot to us. We, we don't know anybody. We don't know any of you people. Never been to Kansas. Well, that meant a lot. That's the family of God. And that's the way it's supposed to happen. I know that everyone doesn't do it. Everyone's not all great. There's some horrible punks in churches, but a lot of sweet people who are doing it right. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And I, now in my own personal life, that people become my family, my sisters and brothers and, and fathers and mothers, my own life, but I've seen it. And it takes, and I've begged this over the years, in every church position I go, I keep on begging it. It takes a vulnerability and courage as us as sisters and brothers to open up to others and say, I want to try to get to know another person, invest in them. What if they hurt me? Well, they might. They might. They might. People betray people all the time. But in general, they don't. And in general, they're, it's worth the effort. One bad apple doesn't ruin it for everything, and so it's it. So this is it's awesome. God really can use when it's done well. Um, and some people need to move out of their family of origin. There are some corrupt, dysfunctional families in this room, in this church. I'm going to look at anybody. In this country city, there's some dysfunctional nonsense we have all come from. And I'm saying God has a rescue operation before the world to come right now. 
And that's when sisters and brothers in Christ are acting like it. We get it a hundredfold if you'll let them. Let them. And that takes courage. Man, it's, it's just worth it. I get so encouraged. Oh, my goodness. Life's discouraging. Life's tough. You know, how's life treating me? Horrible, but God's good. Like, what the, who cares what life is treating me? Life is up and down, but God is good. And one of the ways I know God is good is because he blesses me through people. He blesses me. Oh, my God. And I, won't. I just want to test him. I'm telling you. There have been so many times people send me emails or text or whatever. That exact second I needed to read it. On Facebook, oh my goodness. And people have challenged me. Challenge my thoughts, behaviors, practice. They thought about this, this, and I thought about this. thoughts. Thank you. Because they love me. Not the punks, but the ones who love you. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Man, they're nothing like it. Um, I don't like it. Verse 30. Before they get all haughty about that, oh, I'm going to be my throne, I'm going to be judging Israel, but the first will be last, and the last first. That is, don't get all arrogant about it. Don't get all arrogant and haughty, woohoo, we're better than you are, we get to make it. That's not the point. And he tells a parable to make the point very, very clear. I'm going to move ahead. There's not any questions or comments. For the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. That was very common back then, like it is today, for those who have. This is not racist. I did, this is what happened in Houston. It was very common in Houston at gas stations and home depots for uh, congregants, large uh, crowds or small crowds of Mexicans to be there. They were day laborers. It's very common for people, they go early in the morning and trucks would pull up and say, I need three workers. They hop in the back, oh, there you go. I mean, whatever, from doing, you know, weeding the lawn line or whatever it was. That's the day labor. Well, this, that's an ancient concept. It's around for a long time. And that's what happened. He said, I need some help. After agreeing, verse 2, with the laborers for a denarius a day, that's a typical daily wage. It's kind of like saying minimal wage, but the daily standard wage. They agree, we'll work for that much. So there's nothing unfair here. Look at the matters. There's nothing unfair. But the owner has not duped them. There's a contract. He sent them to his vineyard. And going out on the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. So he goes out to get more. And he says to him, you go to the vineyard too, and whatever's right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he did the same. So this is, Jews started the day at nighttime, sunset to sunset. But they worked usually when the sun started rising. So, so late afternoon, all the way through late afternoon, verse 6, and about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. This is the last possible time that the sun's almost setting. And he says to them, why do you stand here idle all day? He said, well, because no one has hired us. He said, you go to the vineyard too. And when evening came, which isn't much longer, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, that's like the second in command, person who handles the household affairs, call the laborers and pay them the wages, beginning with the last up to the first. So guys, guys just came off the truck. Start with them. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. It's a day's wages. Now the first came, they're the last ones, right? The last one, the first will be last. Jesus just said that. The last will be first. The first will be last. And he gives a parable in Matthew. The last did get paid first. You, you get that? You're looking at me so they're okay. All right. I'll go ahead. They thought they would receive more. Ha <laughs> ha! The guys again, the eleventh hour is getting full days wages. High five, baby! We're going drinking tonight. That's for some of you on here. But each of them also has the same. I just, just whatever that means to you, Cassidy. But each of them also also received the news. And what's the first thing you're going to think? That ain't fair. Verse 11, on receiving it, they grumble out the household. They get it paid, the dairy has to go, oh, wait a second. These, verse 12, these last worked only one hour. Dad, come in, you have made them equal to us. We have borne the bird of the day and the scorching heat. But he said to them, friend, that's to shame them. He, he, they were not his buddies. It's, it's a very kind gesture. It's a shaming. He's being sweet to them when they're, they're being grumbly. So like that's a shaming thing. Sarcasm. A little bit sarcasm, I might say. Yeah, a little bit sarcastic. I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for denarius? Listen to that for a second. I'm not being unjust. We agreed, and I'm paying you what we agreed to. 
Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last as I give to you. Am I allowed to do what I choose for what belongs to me? Verse 15, here's what they're really doing. Or do you begrudge my generosity? They're not ticked off that it's not fair because they agreed to it. They're mad that he's being generous. So the last will be first, the first last. They're mad that he's being generous. I remember Wayne Stacy, Dr. Wayne Stacy, the smartest guy I'd ever met at that point, at least, the professor. He's the one I always said, let me drop a footnote, as I stole that from him. He used to say, oh, and there's a couple of phrases I still remember, you know, because you have a student, a professor, so many times. He used to say, oh, grace isn't fair. Or some of you will say, that's not fair. And he said, you're right. Grace is never fair. That's always stuck with me. Grace is not fair. And that ticks people off until they want it, until they want the grace. Hmm. Think about that. How many times atheists atheist is skeptic? You mean to tell me if Hitler's on his deathbed and he really repented of a sense, he gets forgiven too? That ticks them off. The answer is yes. Yep. True. I ain't right. What if God forgave you of the same sin? Well, I'm not Hitler. All of a sudden, I deserve it. But that's not grace. That's justice. You're getting just deserved. So we don't deserve grace. We don't deserve grace. There's nothing fair about it. We haven't earned it. We haven't earned anything. I used to have another professor, Robert Canoy, my first pastor when I was first. He used to say, I used to say, oh, um, we talk about grace and fairness. He said, you don't want God's fairness. Yeah. You don't want God's fairness. And that has stuck with me forever. You don't want God's justice. I'm going to be fair. No, you do not. Because that means it's going to be fair with you and me. And that's what ticks them off. Not that he's being unfair to them. He's honoring the agreement. He's being unfair with the people who came last. And he's being simply generous. Now, certainly, that's a metaphor for grace. And then early Christians took this parable, it seems to be, and many New Testament interpreters still do, for the Gentiles. The Gentiles came into the fold last. And they get forgiven. That is not fair. Yeah, it's not fair at all. It's just not fair at all. One analogy I was thinking of when I was reading this and trying to prepare, prepare for tonight, um, a couple hours ago, I was thinking, it reminds me, if we were drowning, you know, it's just, praise God, I was on vacation recently, and let's say I'm on the ocean, and we're, we're, all, we're all drowning, and some of, us are, some of us are really kicking hard, get to the top, but we're all drowning. Some of us are close to the top, and I'm not lower because maybe I'm worse. So, um, but Deb was close to the top. And then in walks Alicia and she goes, Scoop. she reaches down the water, grabs hand, and pulls out. Pulls all the beat, pulls all the beat. <laughs> Deborah says, Hey, wait, you pulled David out? She goes, Yeah. Why'd you pull David out? He needed to be saved. But I worked hard. I got it was easy. I got to the top. Mm -hmm. And you were drowning. Well, I ain't right. He was down farther than I was. You see what that is? The response is, I get to, you all needed to be saved, which you might say, you're God here. You were all drowning. Some people, I grab more than others. That's my grace, my mercy. You'll get to decide what I'm gracious to. You'll get to decide. And of course, that's, Stings us if we think about it. I mean, how many people in your life have you thought, I have thought of people, I know a God to be gracious to them. Yeah. Me? Well, I'm not acting like Jesus or thinking like him, and people have hurt me. I'm like, hmm, I don't want it. I'm just going to do it. I don't want it. The disciples say, pull down lightning from heaven and zap these people. Jesus says, knock it off. That's picking and choosing. Picking and choosing. <laughs> it is picking and choosing. And that's right. It's not fair. That's a, I mean, that's the natural. It's not fair that you would pay them the same amount. You know what I've been doing? Jesus' response is, you're right. I have not been dishonest to the people who I had agreement with. You're mad that I've been gracious to people. You think they don't deserve it. And you're right. Grace is not deserved. You do not earn it. It is not fair. Absolutely. We shouldn't be begrudging someone the same gift that we're hopeful to have. Right. We should not be begrudging someone who has the gift that we're hoping to have. Grateful. 
there should not be begrudging him. We should want people to come to Jesus. No matter if they're 98 years old or 12, we want them. Any questions or comments about that? I get frustrated. So just and I appreciate it. So what do we do about people who maybe cut us off or unbelieving? That's a good question. We, and I, I don't have much to say besides to encourage you and all of us. We can't make a person forgive us. We can't make a person like us. We can't make a person love us. We can't make a person want to be around us. But you can say, I love you anyway. That's right. We can say, I love you. Paul says in Romans 12, 13, it, um, you know, as much as it depends upon you, but peaceably and all, you do the best job you can. Which we just can't control people think about us. And we can't. So we can pray for them, but we can't make it happen. It's really not about us how someone treats us. It's about them, how they act. Yeah, how they treat us is about right. how it's they about think how they right. feel. It is, it really is. People say, that made me feel. Well, not really. You made me do that. No, you had control of yourself. But, and the second thing I'd say is, you said sometimes I get, was it disappointed, frustrated? What was the word? I get frustrated. And that's okay. Frustrated, frustrated is a feeling, and frustrated is okay. Frustrated is just a form of anger. Sometimes you get mad. So you just own it. Yeah, it makes me mad. I just want to make a difference in people's lives. And I'm glad you want to make a difference in people's lives. It might not be that one. It might not be that one. <laughs> it might not be that one. And it might be, and you just don't know. I'm trying to encourage you, though. I'm convinced, based on a lot of reasons I won't say right now, I'm convinced that in the world to come, we will know the difference we made in every person's life. I think we will know. I think they'll come to you and say, you don't know, but one day you greeted me at a time, and blah, blah, and that made a difference in my day. And because of that, I went home and it was nicer to my mom. And then because of that, that, that there's a ripple effect of dominoes. And you didn't know 34 years later I accepted Jesus, but it all started that day when I was going to be suicide or depressed or sad. You smiled at me. I'm convinced we, I'm, con, I'm just convinced of it. So we don't know the effect of what happened to them. We don't have a perspective. So we're supposed to be like Jesus and leave the consequences to him. But at the same time, having healthy boundaries like Jesus, we don't overly chase them and have over-emotional, please come back, please come back, what can I do? And I, you lose yourself in the process. Nope, nope, nope. You love your, your neighbor as you love yourself. And to have a, love yourself means you got to have a self. you got to have a self. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Want? Even, even when we think we fail at something, it's still good practice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even if we fail, it's good practice. I'm going to say something real brief on this, and we're going to stop for tonight. Let's see if I can make it through. That was um, this next part. It's pretty quick here. Good stuff. Because Jesus was going to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside on the way. He said to them, and remember, he's going to Jerusalem. This is time to die. He said, Behold, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And deliver him to the Gentiles, be mocked and scourged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. It's interesting that in Mark's gospel, he's just and killed. By the time we get to Matthew and Luke, which are later gospels, they specifically say crucified. But in Mark's gospel, he will be killed. That's a But the point is, he's saying it's coming. I'm not going there to establish a kingdom on earth. He's trying to be explicit about that, and I don't think we're going to get the point. Because they don't understand that. Verse twenty. Here's my evidence. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him. In Mark's gospel, they do it. In Matthew's gospel, old mama, mama bear, Jesus, hook a sister up. <laughs> Whether sons, Nian, please. He says, what do you want? She says, command that these two sons of mine may sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Let them be your VPs, big dogs. But Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? That is, you might say a cup of wrath or a cup of anguish. He said, they say, yeah, we're able, sure. He said, okay, you will drink my cup. That is, you, you're going to go through persecution. And they did later on. But to sit in my right hand, my left is not mine to drink, but it's for these, those for whom it has been prepared for my father. My father decides that I'm not. And when the ten heard it, they were ticked off at the two brothers. Man, that got me. What about us? Which makes you think that those other disciples have been already debating it. I'm gonna be the best. No, I'm gonna be the best. I'm gonna be, no, I'm gonna they beat him to the punch. Hey mama, go ask Jesus, quick, quick. Before Thomas gets up there. 
But Jesus called them all, everybody come back. First 25, all the disciples, come here, come here, come here, listen. He, gets, he makes it an object lesson for all you teachers out there. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. That is, they're domineering. They lord it over them. They, they really, yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. They do do that, that's right. And their great men exercise authority over them. Yeah, that's true too. Yep, yeah, yeah, they do do that. They just force it down our neck. We're in subject in subjugation to them. He says, not among you. Not among you. It's not how I roll. And the kingdom of God, the last and least deserving, get great treatment. And the least, whoever's great, must be your servant. Whoever will be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and he gave his life as a ransom for many. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Things are reversed. Sisters and brothers, man, we look around and think the haves and have-nots, and wouldn't it be great to have them and all their power and authority, and they've got it all, oh, look at there, look at there, look at there. Jesus says, not only is it very hard for the rich to make it, in the world to come, they are not on top. They're not on top. The people who, you don't know their name, drools me out because you know my name. They're sweeping in the back. They're working anonymously. They're doing the hard work. They're talking about Jesus. They're trying to share the gospel with their friends and family. He says, man, wait till you see the world to come. They're your ruling. But that's not how it works. You know, they don't lord it over. That's why the Crusades kill all the Muslims, the Saracens, whatever. Absolute nonsense. Evil, non-Christian. You'll never do that. You never force someone to believe. Muslims, for centuries, and some still do, you convert by the sword. Christians are not supposed to do that. Jesus didn't do that. And last but not least, this last one, I'll finish chapter 20. He went out to Jericho, out of Jericho, great crowd, big old crowd, two blind men sitting by the roadside. And Mark is just one, man, he always has two. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they said, Have mercy on us, son of David. That means you recognize you're a king, you're royalty. Have mercy. The crowd said, basically, shut up, be quiet. Which made them cry even more. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Be quiet. God don't want to listen to you. Thank you for saying that. Jesus! And Jesus, they said more, Lord, have mercy on us. Man, I'm telling you, sister, brother, you can't listen to the haters. Those people, they ain't listening. Don't worry, I give up. Oh, you can't listen to that. Let that be fuel. I'm glad you said be quiet. I'm glad you said, I'm glad you told me you thought I'd listen. Wrong. And Jesus stopped, called and said, what do you want to do for you? They said, Lord, their eyes be open. We want to see. And Jesus, in pity, mercy, touched their eyes. They immediately received sight. <coughs> All of them. Was the mercy. Any questions or comments? Mary? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Luckily, the first or the last get the same reward. That's right. The first Generally. and the last get the same reward. That's right. So. That's right. And it's interesting, Jesus never tells us what. He never describes the reward, it seems to me, literally as physical things. It's always metaphorical ways of saying, you get to make it. I'm okay with that. But anyway, so we do get the same reward. We all get saved from drowning. That was my analogy point. We don't all make it. I use that analogy like that because I love this world. One day. God willing, he's going to send me back there to the promised land. If someone said, if someone said, I agree, hey, hey man, I five, virtual high five. So if he said, you get to make it in Disney World, well, which ride do I get? You get all of them. That's good enough for me. Just give me the gold ticket. What's it up? DavidBenderRouse.com, pick out. That's what I'm on. Just a joke. Just a joke. Sorry. Anything else? <laughs> I should get rolled to a Disney World. That deep dish pizza. What else do I talk about? A lot? Food, food oh, vouchers. Zero. Right? What? Kid, what food vouchers? It's food vouchers. I call my sister. <laughs> I know a guy who lo I love it. Uh, back in Houston, he had a lot of Twitter followers, and he grew a big beard and whatever. So he contacted these people and say, "Hey, give me free oil and stuff, beard, whatever." I'll talk about your product. And they did. They sent him free product for months and months. He's a big old dude. He got free protein shakes all the time. He went to the local place where they gave, um, it was a burrito place. It was kind of like a Chipotle. He talked to me to give him 
uh, free food like once a month, twice a month, or something for free, just as long as he promoted it. He got all that. He went to another place. It's great burgers, it's expensive too. And then did this drawing to do free for a year. And he told him first he started out with doing that. He goes, "Well, we're doing this drawing." He actually won it, so he got free food for a year from this place. And he would take you with him. He's like, "So I'm, he's with me." I mean, it was awesome. So, hey, you you received not because you asked him. That's what I'm going to say. Prayer for us. Um, but that's, there was no therefore. I'm not leading up to buying me a car or something. I just, I, just, I thought that was kind of a funny story. Thank you, God, that the last and the first, just as Susan just said, and Lord, as you said, we get the same reward. I think I can speak for all of us in here and online in the podcast too when I say, I ask for us that you would help us be like those little children. You would help us be like them. You would help us not be like those who rebuke them. That is to say, those that we would not be the people who are trying to block people to come to you because we don't think it's fair. Help us not try to block people into the kingdom of God. Help us let go and process our anger, rage, sadness, frustration, whatever. When those things seem unfair. Lord Jesus, help us receive your grace. Help us as well, Spirit, have wisdom when we try to use our bodies for your glory in any kind of sexual way, whatever it might be, eyes, ears, whatever. Help us honor you and your design. And that very sensitive, thorny issue where there's real people involved. Oh God, please give us your grace. Help us speak truth and gentleness when it's needed. But help us certainly, certainly be like you when we treat people. Lord Jesus, for other needs, for other worries, concerns, and joys that my sisters and brothers have, we give those to you. And thank you so much for the great privilege. Enjoy this for me, at least, to study Matthew so closely once again. Thank you for shaping us. Spirit, thank you for the great work you're doing in several people's lives. I know this church, including in this room, it's so exciting to see you change lives. It's so exciting to see people give more of themselves to you, more of themselves, and more as you change. You get people off of addictions and, and the relationships are being restored and wounds are being healed. You're on the move. Please open up our eyes to that and see that the world is so much bigger than our small world. I confess it is easy for me, I know for other people as well, to get focused on our own small worlds, our own anxieties and stresses, and let those reign supreme. Jesus, help us be like the children who came to you carefree and trusting you know that you've got us. So even tonight, for those who are reminded that they're held on your lap, remind them. For those that need strength, we strengthen them. For those in wisdom, please grant your wisdom. As James says, it's first of all pure, peaceable. So please grant us your peace. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Amen.